Welcome you to the chapel of Lansdowne Woods. We're so glad you're all here. It's a pretty good turnout today, too. We're happy with that. So, um, we, wel we welcome you here. We're glad you're here. And during these Sundays in Lent, Pastor Jason's going to be our preacher. And we'll focus on the last 24 hours of Jesus' life. We hope that you'll be blessed during our time of worship. Now join us in our opening hymn. It's called Who Is He? It's number 3082 in the Green Hymnal. And it's sung the tune of Joyful, Joyful, We Adore You.
Our reading today comes from Mark 11. Many people, can you hear me? Many people spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut in the fields. Then those who went ahead and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna! <clears throat> Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of the ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest. Now please join us in the call to worship by reading the words of the fold. In joy we gather this day. Hosanna to Jesus the Christ. Remembrance we gather this day. Hosanna to the Son of David. In festive celebration and quiet reflection we gather to worship and pray. Hosanna to the Son of God. Join in our opening, opening prayer. Let us pray together. Jesus, you have walked the road together with us many times. Guide our steps and keep us close. Inspire our worship today with your loving presence and your work in our lives. That your spirit may flow through us as we seek to stir, observe, and show compassion to all. The anthem today is called Entrance into Jerusalem. Verses 25 to 39. It was nine o'clock in the morning when they crucified him. The inscription of the, of the charge against him read, The King of the Jews. And with him they crucified two bandits, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by derided him, shaking their heads and saying, Aha, you who would destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. The same way the chief priests, along with the scribes, 
were also mocking him among themselves and saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. Let the Messiah, the King of Israel, come down from the cross now, so that we may see and believe. Those who were crucified with him also taunted him. And when it was noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. At three o'clock, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Elo, Elo, lema sabatani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of the bystanders heard it, they said, Listen, he is calling for Elijah. And someone ran, filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a stick, and gave it to him to drink, saying, Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come and take him down. And Jesus gave a loud cry and breathed his last. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Now when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, Truly, this man was God's son. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. And thank you, Nan. Happy Palm Sunday. Thank you. Good to be with you. Thank you. And Nan, that was not an easy scripture to read, but you did it like a pro. <laughs> Just great. Here we are at the end of Lent. After centuries and centuries, millennia, really, of human history, human beings behaving badly, getting it wrong. In only 24 hours, Jesus makes it right. In 24 hours, Jesus changed the world. Today, we celebrate not only Palm Sunday, but his passion. So think of it as Palm and Passion Sunday as we look to him on the cross. And Jesus changed everything by dying. Think about this. Making right our relationship with God. Something we couldn't do ourselves. We began this journey of Lent. Uh, that story of what we call Maundy Thursday or Holy Thursday. We're going to celebrate it coming up this week. But think about those last 24 hours of his life. Around sundown on Thursday, they began to celebrate the Passover meal or the, the celebration, uh, what we call now the Last Supper. And Jesus had only been active on earth in his life and ministry about three years, 250 recorded actions of Jesus' life and ministry in the four Gospels. And you get down to those last 24 hours, it was approximately two dozen. Two dozen powerful acts of love occurred this last day. But I want you to think about Palm Sunday as we've celebrated it, thinking about that procession coming into Jerusalem, Jesus, and people waving these palm branches that you have some right there in your hands. Think about Jesus coming in, being hailed, Hosanna. Uh, the words would be literally, our God saves. So people are trusting in this deep meaning, this power of God that really is unseen. You have to trust it. You have to have faith, right? What they also could see on that day in Jerusalem, lesser known fact, is that the Roman governor, uh, Pilate, the governor, was also processing in at the same time. Because a large crowd of people, more than 100,000 people at that time, would gather in Jerusalem for this festival of Passover. So the Roman overseer would come and make a big show of being the ruler, you know, Roman rule with much pomp and circumstance. Well, imagine this procession of Roman officials and soldiers, and they required people to wave palm branches to honor Caesar. Caesar, who was called a son of God, right? And Jesus and his followers do a very similar thing, but they have a very different meaning, different reason for doing it. Now, the Romans, they paraded into Jerusalem from the west. Okay, get this. And Jesus comes in the opposite place. He comes in from the east. Why? Think about the east. Well, that's the direction of the rising sun. And he had just come a short distance from a little town called Bethany, where he had some friends. What happened there? He had just raised Lazarus 
from the dead. A little foretaste of what's about to come when Jesus on the next Sunday will be raised in glory, resurrected, showing who's really king here, who's really in charge, but God who has power even over death. But we get ahead of ourselves a little bit. That's next week. Let's go first to the cross as you just heard this powerful scripture. A reminder of this story that, that everything that Jesus did, all that he talked about, everything he stood for, culminated in this terrible moment we call Good Friday. It is 9 o'clock in the morning on a Friday. And we call it good because of what Jesus did. Not what happened to him. That was terrible. But what he did, what meaning he brought out of it, the purpose for which he did it, which is out of deep love for you and for me. Think about him on that morning going to the cross. Jesus has just spent all night awake. He had been arrested. He had been you know, betrayed. He had been falsely accused. He was convicted of something he didn't do. He had been 39 stripes struck with that cat of nine tails or the, the Roman flag room, as it's called, a weapon of torture. He was exhausted, dehydrated, humiliated, weak on every level of human experience. Jesus was suffering. And then he was told, you've got to carry this cross beam. So he's carrying one post of the cross to which they're about to nail him. About a quarter of a mile out of the city of Jerusalem to Golgotha, meaning the hill of the skull. And there they crucified him. Now, if you could imagine witnessing, being there up close and personal with Jesus, you would see the worst form of punishment. Crucifixion originated maybe millennia before the Romans were using it at this time. It probably came from ancient Assyria. The Greeks used it for sure, but Romans made it famous, or infamous, we should say. So we often think of it as a Roman invention, but it's more ancient. Crucifixion was the worst. Uh, Cicero, the Roman statesman, wrote, and I quote, it's the extreme and ultimate punishment, the cruelest and most disgusting penalty. Or... The Jewish historian Josephus said, the most pitiable of deaths. It was intended to be an effective deterrent to crime. It took place along a main thoroughfare. But we think of it as a way called the Via del Rosa, the, the way of suffering, the way that Jesus walked to the cross. So imagine him there carrying that horizontal cross beam that could have weighed 75 or even as much as 100 pounds. In his weakened condition, it was almost impossible for him to do it. And so we learn in the scripture that they had to recruit a bystander out of the crowd to help him carry the cross. And then at the site of the execution, they would nail his hands or wrists to the cross beam while he was laying on the ground and then hoist him up. So if you could just go with me for a minute uh, in your mind, you could imagine how difficult this would be. I don't want to get too graphic. I want to give you some details to help you imagine what it really would be like. The vertical post of the cross would already be firmly in place. And so Jesus would then lay down on the beam on the ground. And at that point, his arms and hands were fixed to the beam. Now, you may have seen it in different pictures or artwork, Christian artwork. Or, of course, in our day and time, there have been many movies. And a lot of times, Jesus is portrayed with the... Uh, nail right through the center of his palm. Okay, but we know from medical and also historical and archaeological evidence that that wouldn't have been the case. Now, I don't mean to disrupt anybody's thought about Jesus. I'm going to take it away from you, but it's the idea that the hand, the bones and the flesh of the hand would not support body weight uh, hanging on a nail like that. So it was likely that these large nails were driven right through the wrist, so right below your palm, in between those bones of the wrist, and that would support the body weight. Now, it's difficult to just imagine this. Uh, my whole point is not exactly where, I mean, biblical, you could say it's biblical too, because the word in Greek in the Bible for hand include the anatomy of the wrist. So it was understood back then. They didn't have as accurate an anatomical description as we do. But it would have been right. And my whole point is that it would have just been difficult for this to have happened. 
right? For Jesus to be laying there, how difficult for the executioner. It's process of finding that sweet spot where the nail would go in, and then it would be a slow, clumsy, and a process that would require repeated blows to get the nail through the person's wrist, flesh, and bone, and into the wood enough to hold. Now, the executioners would then hoist him up and attach the crossbeam to the vertical post. And all of that movement, while hanging only on your wrists, would have been terrible. I don't know words really to describe it. But then, after all of that, they would affix the feet to the vertical beam. What we have learned, what I remember growing up mainly, was that there were you know, a total of three nails. So one nail that would go through both feet and into the wood. But more recent archaeological evidence shows that it's possible, quite frequent, that um, a criminal crucified would have one foot on either side of the vertical post. Okay, what they found in 1968 was an ossuary, a bone box, where a person had been crucified by the Romans, and the nail was still in the heel bone. And with the nail in the heel bone were shards of wood. And so it's understood that the Romans probably developed it so using the larger bone, the heel bone, you would, again, it's all about maximum suffering for the longest length of time. So you would attach the victim to the vertical post in a way that would make them live a little bit longer because using the weight of that, the strength of that heel bone, in dying on the cross, you are actually suffocating, right? So all of the weight is on the chest cavity, and it's hard to breathe. And so you'd actually have to push, push up with the nails in your feet in order to catch your breath. And that would just take longer. And that was really the point for the Romans, was to maximize suffering. So it's likely that Jesus actually had four nails, and you know, one in each foot on either side of that vertical beam. And, and it was very, very Painful Death by crucifixion was literally excruciating. We hear that word in English. The root of the word excruciate is crucify. Think about that. Excruciating pain. It comes from the understanding of crucifying. Uh, the King James elsewhere uses a word in English. We don't use any word uh, anymore, but it's called long-suffering. This seems very appropriate for Jesus' experience on the cross. Sometimes it took a, a prisoner or a criminal um, all day long to die, some overnight and into the following day before they died. And, and the birds of prey, buzzards, would come and, and start to do what they do, uh, even before the mercy of death arrived for some people who were there that long. Again, the goal of crucifixion was to inflict the maximum amount of agony for the longest possible time before someone died. Jesus was on the cross for six hours. Not as long as some, but long enough. Six serious hours of suffering. So let me go one other place while you imagine Jesus on the cross with me. Think about the height, the height of the cross. You know, so often uh, we think about it being really high up there. You know, I'm looking here at this beautiful brass cross on the altar table. That altar table stands over four feet tall, or right about four feet tall. Jesus, uh, we learned from, again, history and archaeology, that likely most Roman crosses were about nine feet tall. So that Jesus' feet would probably be uh, somewhere in that purple, beautiful pyramid right there, above the IHS. So he would be just that Close to the ground. Okay? A lot of times, we disconnect. We distance ourselves from Jesus on the cross. What do we say? We have a hymn that says, On a hill far away. A lot of pictures of the cross depict very small crosses, way over there on the hill. Or we sing with exultant words, like lift high the cross, like it's high, it's above me. It's removed from us, distanced from us. We disconnect from that very human experience of Jesus' suffering. So imagine you were there, and his feet aren't but that high off the ground. Who was there? 
two of his closest friends, and his mother Mary. His mother Mary, Jesus suffering his cross was so close, Mary could reach out and touch him during those hours of agony. She could reach up, maybe even touch his face. Can you imagine Jesus in his human suffering, up close, that close to you? Maybe you'll do this later today. I know later today I'll probably have a cup of coffee. When you reach up to a shelf in your kitchen cabinet, remember Jesus on the cross is that close. That close. So that helps me. What happened to Jesus was very real. It was very personal. Which brings me to the crux or the heart of the matter, if you will. The very meaning of of his sacrifice, helping you think it through these different details that we learn from history and from scholarship and from archaeology. All of that's well and good. But for me, the heart of the matter is what is most important. What meaning does the cross have for you? Well, there's such meaning in Jesus' own personal sacrifice of love because Jesus experienced, willingly experienced, the full range of human suffering. Think about it in summary. Betrayal, abandonment, and denial. He suffered from his closest friends. Jealousy, anger, and rejection. Jesus suffered from the religious authorities. The, the, the people that he was supposed to be working with. I mean, he was a Jew himself, and he got all of that rejection from the powers that be. Bullying, beating, ridicule, and violence from the soldiers that last day of his life. This full range of experience demonstrates Jesus' full humanity. He was completely human. So that his atoning sacrifice is sufficient for you and I, for whatever we suffer, for whatever we've done. It's redeemed because Jesus was fully human and went through this full range of suffering. We as Christians, we've come up with this, you know, uh, understanding of it over the years. And uh, quite simply, we call it Christ's atoning sacrifice. It's about atonement. What is that? Real briefly, let me tell you again, remind you of the meaning. All through history with people of faith, going back to the Old Testament, you know, there's this idea that, that God is holy. And human beings, we are not. And we sin. And, and when there is sin, there must be a sacrifice. There must be blood that is shed. There must be an offering. Because, yes, we can pray and ask for forgiveness. And God is forgiving. And forgiveness assuages our guilt. But what makes up for? There needs to be amends. There needs to be something that makes amends for, makes up for what we did, the wrong that we did. What makes it right? So this idea of atonement which is a big Christian word, and we've heard it before, and we think we don't understand what it means. For me, I like simple. So I like to break it down into three parts. Atonement, at one meant. We are meant to be at one with God, and we cannot achieve that ourselves. Christ does it on the cross. We are meant to be at one with God, and Christ died for all of us to atone, to make us one with God to make it right. What does this loving sacrifice of Christ mean to you? You know, these 24 hours have changed the world, but have they changed the world in you? That's a question I want to leave with you. What is the meaning that you bring to the cross and connect with on the cross? It's so important to think it through. Meaning is everything for people of faith. Viktor Frankl, a Jew, a survivor of the concentration camps of World War II, said that he noticed a significant difference among people in the death camps. And he asked, as he wrote about it after his experience, he asked, why? Why do some people who are imprisoned and have no hope just throw themselves on the electric fences and totally give up? They're done. While others, other people seem to be able to find courage and to keep going. And even to help people. Well, he concluded, they had made meaning, spiritual meaning, 
out of their suffering. Think about that. What is the spiritual meaning that you take from this most important action of God's love for you, Jesus, willing, self-sacrificing love on the cross? Well, I'm going to explain it using Scripture and just a couple of verses as I conclude. Listen to this. I think it's probably the best understanding of what's accomplished on the cross. In Romans chapter 5, starting with verse 6, Paul writes and explains to us, while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Indeed, rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though perhaps a good person, someone might actually dare to die for them. But God proves his love for us, that in while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more surely, since we have now been justified by his blood, we will be saved through him. For if we... While we were enemies, were reconciled to God through the death of his son. Much more certainly, having been reconciled, we will be saved by his life. The way I would like to say that myself is, Christ died our death so that we may live his life. See how that works? That loving sacrifice of Jesus is what he did for us. Christ died our death so we can live his life. But let me just sum this up. I don't, I don't want you to miss this because we've been all these weeks during Lent looking at the last 24 hours. And, and I don't want you to miss this point. Uh, I hope I've made this point. Uh, Jesus' full humanity redeems all of our human experiences. So we often spend our time in, in the world that we live in. Uh, if there's anything negative, if there's anything uh, that we don't like to feel or experience, we try to minimize that. If we're suffering, if there's any pain, uh, we want a treatment for that. We want a, a pill, you know, some sort of medicine, right? But Jesus seems to be teaching us that there can be actually deep meaning in experiencing the pains, the sorrows, the suffering of life. There's even redemption through our faults and our failures, that even our brokenness has beauty for God and can be utilized for us to reach and touch others when they're at their worst moments with love as well. So Jesus lived fully human, and he died a fully human death, suffering on every level, to remind us that our suffering is never in vain. Our experiences are not without deep meaning when we see them through the cross of Jesus Christ. Jesus died our death so we might live his life. And so may this act of love change the world and especially change the world in you. Amen. 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 I'm going to invite you now as we take a minute to sing, to think about Jesus. Think about him on that cross and the love that he has for you. Please stand as you're able. 287, we'll sing three verses. O oh, love divine, what hast thou done?
seated, please, as we get ready for the call to prayer. take time to be in prayer. Will you lift up your hearts to God with me and let's pray. Almighty God, we come to this Holy Week, both with the celebration of Palm Sunday and the anticipation and the meditation upon Jesus on Good Friday. We come with our hearts echoing with hosannas, and also contemplating the deep meaning of Jesus on the cross for us. Lord, hear all of our prayers. Lord, on the cross, you bore the weight of that cross beam as you carried it along the way of suffering. But even more than that, you carried the weight of the world with all of our sorrows, with all of our sufferings. You carried the weight of all of our faults and failures, and you bore them out of deep love for us, out of faithfulness to God and what God had asked you to do. So Jesus, we give you thanks. For you did for us what we could not do for ourselves. You made us right with God and with each other. You made us to live at one with God and with each other. And so help us to do just that today. Lord, in our heart of hearts, we want to live before you a life that reflects love. God, we want to live toward each other from a heart full of love. But we can't do this alone. So help us by your grace, by the power and presence of your spirit. So Lord, we pray for one another. We pray for our families and friends during this special Holy Week. We pray that you might encourage our faith where we have doubts, where we have struggles, where we have really not taken very many steps. We pray that you would encourage us. Help us to be patient with others as well. Lord, may we forgive and let go of any weights that we might be carrying, any grudge that we might be bearing. Lord, empower us to forgive. And so, O oh God, hear all of our prayers. You know in our hearts we have those for whom we're concerned those in need of healing. Lord, we pray, pray for your help and healing. God, we know there are those who are grieving deaths in our families or among our friends and loved ones, and we pray for those. Lord, may your love and peace touch and hold their hearts. For on the cross, O oh God, in Jesus, you held every one of us 
in those purest hands, you held every human experience that we have. And you hold out love for all of us. So by your love, may we endure. May we continue to seek ways to follow you more closely. We pray for this world, oh God, that you love so much, where it is broken and where people are truly suffering, where there's war and violence, and people are impoverished, where there's hatred. Lord, bring help and show love, because you bore this weight on the cross as well. So help us to be your hands now, no longer bound to a cross, but help us as your hands to reach out and help others. And God, help us to be your feet, no longer nailed, but set free to move with joy and love for all whom we meet. We pray all of these prayers, spoken and unspoken, in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray by saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, let's give God thanks and offer our gifts and our tithes to the Lord. Could the ushers meet me up front? I don't know about you, but I always feel very grateful for Easter and Holy Week. So, in a moment of prayer here, lift up in your own hearts that which you're grateful for. Let us pray. Almighty God, thank you for the meaning of this season. Thank you for the love of Jesus Christ and for the gifts of our hands and from our hearts, O oh Lord. We ask your blessing. Bless each gift, each giver, so that we... And these gifts may be used to your service always, like Jesus did, from a heart of deep love for people. We pray in his name and all God's people say, Amen. Amen. Jesus keep me near the cross.
beautiful music. If you feel blessed by the music in this service, say amen with me. Amen. <laughs> On the back of your bulletin, this may be interesting for particularly females, right? Uh, Chapel, Chapel Women's Fellowship this week, uh, next week, sorry, a week from this week. Um, April 3rd, Wednesday at 11 a.m. in the music studio with lunch at noon at Marie de la Fleur. Uh, sign up. That's what we need. Sign up so we can plan for that. So grateful for Rachel and others helping with the Chapel Women's Fellowship. One more uh, joy that I want to share with you. Um, so grateful for Pastor Steve, who uh, stood up and spoke at the end of last service here last week. He did that this morning over at Galilee. So, Steve, we're so grateful. He's back here. All right, in the back, Steve and Brenda. So grateful for you continuing to recover and rebound like you stood right here months ago and said it's treatable and it's beatable. We're so grateful to see God deliver on that promise. Amen. So receive this benediction. Now, wherever you go, may God go with you. Whatever you need, may God provide for you. Whenever you fail, may God forgive you. And whenever you lay down for the last time, may God raise you up forevermore. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you.